But we have some guests, uh, three guests tonight. Um, they are helping a uniquely Catholic newspaper flourish at a time when, in fact, in general, the print media is dying out nationwide. There are lots of newspapers that are going out of business or they are not being able to uh, print. And from this uh, medium that we have, uh, which th this newspaper started in 1927, the National Catholic Register branded itself as a Catholic newspaper with, quote, snap, vigor, and courage. You almost think that that's the start of the name of a serial or something. <laughs> but, there's, but it's easy to read. It's always loyal to the church and has no selfish acts to grind. So here to tell us more, we ask you to welcome the former editor-in-chief, Fran Meyer, the blog and social media editor, Kevin Knight, and the current editor-in-chief of the National Catholic Register, Jeanette DeMello. Welcome. Good to have you. Thank 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 you. So 90 years, that's a pretty good start. Oh, I'd say so, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah it's yeah, an amazing yeah. story, really. Yeah. Uh, which one of you would be the best to tell us about the origins of the National Catholic Register? Well, it's a, it's a fascinating story. Uh, Monsignor Smith, when he came, um, when he went to Denver in 1913 to take over a failing newspaper with, he said there were 1,400 subscribers. It was a table in the back of a cattleman's newsletter office, and they were $4,000 in debt. Mm -hmm. uh, he no, and that's $4,000 in 1913 dollars. That's a lot so of money. They were way over their head. Mm -hmm. So he borrowed a typewriter from the cattleman, and that fall, he said, he had the very strong feeling that he should start a national newspaper with a circulation of 100,000, 10 times bigger than any Catholic newspaper had achieved to that point. He just had to knock, knock out a couple of obstacles. He was a layman at the time. He had to go to seminary and he had to deal with the Ku Klux Klan. The, in, was the Klan in Colorado? The Klan was strong in uh, Colorado, Indiana, mm -hmm. uh, and very much so in Colorado. And Until 1951. Till, right. And he was very instrumental because he was on their radar early. Uh, he and several other priests. This is something I, I don't think a lot of folks understand. No. The Ku Klux Klan is usually associated with the South because it began, I believe, in Tennessee. But it was widespread. The state of Oregon had a mm -hmm. very large influential Ku Klux Klan that made Catholic schools illegal. Connecticut had a big Klan. And as you mentioned, Indiana and lots of other right. states. This was not just a southern phenomenon. No, it wasn't, and he wrote about this. He, he said it's, uh, the first Klan was very much a southern phenomenon, but this was the second incarnation of the Klan, mm -hmm. and it really drew a lot of its strength out of Hollywood. A uh, movie, uh, Birth of a Nation. Yes. So many of the, the th elements we associate with the Klan now, even the costumes, all of the ceremonies, a lot of those were designed by set designers for that movie. So no. it, it just appealed to people the same way Star Wars did. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you telling me that Hollywood did the clothing design for the Ku Klux Klan? Absolutely, that, that whole aesthetic yeah. was drawn from that movie. It, it was a blockbuster in the time of silent shorts. It was a three hour long uh, epic movie and it really captured the imagination of people throughout the nation. Well, as a matter of fact, the president at that time was one of the most liberal presidents we ever had right. until very recently. That was Woodrow Wilson, and he loved that movie. He absolutely loved it. He, I think he said it was history written in lightning was his endorsement of the movie. Right. And the effects of that movie, uh, again, it, took this and went nationwide, and some of the people who suffered uh, were priests, and of course Catholics were the main, one of the main targets of their yes. anger. Uh, one of the cases that really was kind of a shot across the bow, 
so to speak, at Monsignor Smith, was a colleague of his here in Birmingham. He was... Um, he Father was Coyle? Fa Father Coyle, exactly. Uh, Monsignor Smith talked about this case a lot. He uh, talked about the shooting. Uh, Monsignor Coyle was... So our audience may not know all. We've done programs on it, but tell us just real briefly what right. the real story briefly, of Father Coyle. Father Coyle, um, he uh, witnessed a wedding. He had a wedding um, between a young woman and a young man in Birmingham. And, and then, he had baptized the woman. Right, he had baptized the woman, Ruth. Um, her father was angered at this. He showed up at the rectory an hour later and shot Father Coyle to death. Yeah, his father was a Methodist minister who, while well, father was saying his divine office, shot him at prayer. Right, and, and here's, here's where the register and Monsignor Smith come into this. The, the defense attorney in that case, of course, the Klan rallied, mm -hmm. and they got a Klan attorney to... Hugo uh, Black. Hugo Black, and he, uh, his career was really launched with this case. Mm -hmm. He gained notoriety. Monsignor Smith knew that he had to document this, these untold stories that, um, like Hugo Black, once he, he became senator for two terms, uh, was eventually in 1937 became a Supreme Court justice. Yeah, so again, so folks understand, Hugo Black was elected as a senator who was a member of the Ku Klux Klan right. from Alabama. Right. And then in 1936, when President uh, Roosevelt, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, expanded the Supreme Court, he appointed this Klansman to the Supreme Court. Right, and he had the National Catholic Register fighting him every step of the way. Yes. The, because the uh, murder on the street is one thing, and then for this cultural tide to sweep out of it, he knew that people need needed to be told the truth. Uh, and this couldn't be done in any other way mm -hmm. um, than journalism in just an ongoing and incessant pursuit of the truth. Something that folks also should know about Hugo Black, and why it is so important for Catholic media to pursue this, the same Hugo Black is the Supreme Court Justice who in 1947 introduced the principle of separation of church and state right. based on a letter by Thomas Jefferson, but not on the Constitution. And that was done to stop Catholic school children from getting, any, from getting rides on the school buses in New Jersey. Right, and Monsignor Smith and his early colleagues, they knew that ideas had consequences. Yep. And they knew that, uh, they saw how short the memory of our nation was for a, a KKK defense lawyer to rise to such heights. Mm -hmm. And he knew, uh, of course he always knew, but uh, uh, with the culture not being our friend, he knew that something had to be done. And so in 1927, November 8th, 1927, he founded the National Catholic Register. Excellent. Yeah, because uh, Black was elected to the Senate in the 20s. Was it the right, 24? Right, just before that, I think, uh, 26? 24 or 26. Yeah, 24 or 26. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then he, again, uh, President Roosevelt appointed him to the Supreme Court. Um, the a close connection between, you know, uh, the Ku Klux Klan and president, very liberal presidents, like Roosevelt and Wilson mm -hmm. is very important to understand right. that they may have been liberal on some policies, but they were not liberal uh, and not correct on issues of race or religious freedom. And they were dead set against the Catholic Church. Yep. Some things haven't changed. Nope. <laughs> but and the, the Klan melted away or uh, in the 1920s, just on the eve of the Register's founding. And that's one of the things that cleared the way because they also pursued Mon Monsignor Smith, trying to keep him from pursuing this work. They hired private detectives, tried to frame him. Uh, around the nation, there were, he documented other cases of priests being called out to sick calls that turned out to be uh, fake sick calls, and mm -hmm. they, were, uh, they were murdered. And so 
and he suspects that that almost happened to him on one occasion. Mm -hmm. So he, he knew the environment and he knew how to, uh, how to survive in that. Now, in 1926 or so, they just s collapsed uh, nationwide, but that stream was still there. And, and of course, the stream that propelled Hugo Black and, and 10,000 others like him into the cultural mainstream. They yes. weren't so much, they didn't so much vanish from the face of the earth as they um, were assimilated into the culture. See, this, this is an important element of understanding why a Catholic media is so important to shine light into the darkness of evil. Racism is evil and religious bigotry is evil. And that's exactly what they were able to do with this newspaper. Well, they were because Monsignor Smith's colleagues in the secular press, he, he talked to them privately. They were all afraid of the Klan and sure. they knew how evil the Klan, uh, uh, they knew their designs, they knew how dangerous they were even to our democracy. Yep. But they were all afraid, they had no courage. And they also, he said, didn't have the sanity that comes with having solid philosophy and divine revelation yeah. on your side. So he knew that the press, not just the Catholic press, not just a little side thing, but the press itself had to we had to restore this sanity uh, to the press and this clear-mindedness and this courage. And how long did Monsignor Smith stay with the uh, press? He was the there until register? his death in 1960. 1960. So he was there through the Depression, World War II, and uh, the Cold War, the yeah. early years of the Cold War. Yeah. Some yeah. big years. And at its, at its height, uh, Monsignor Smith had 850,000 uh, copies of the register going all over the country and this was through the register system of newspapers mm -hmm. uh, so he worked with dioceses and bishops throughout uh, the country uh, mm -hmm. to spread the newspaper there so there were a system of newspapers uh, that he enabled. Now friend you used to be the editor. Yes I did. At what, point did uh, at what point did you get on the staff? I came on in early September of 78. Uh, in so the there were other editors between Monsignor Riley, and you. Patrick Riley was my predecessor. Mm -hmm. And um, I joined in 78. Uh, Paul VI had died in August. Uh, mm -hmm. John Paul I had just been elected 10 days earlier. And then about a month later, you know, John Paul II was mm -hmm. elected. And that really became the North Star for the way that we handled things for the next 15 years, the uh, thinking of Carol Waitiwa and the problems that we faced were quite different from the ones that Kevin has um, articulated. We, you remember the confusion after the council. I mean, that was remember it. Some <laughs> people accused me of causing some of it. But go on. Well, it was a, it was a time when there was a huge amount of uncertainty and conflict within the church, and to some degree that continues now, obviously. But uh, with the election of Carol Waitiwa, you had a man who was both profoundly faithful, deeply faithful, and, and devotional in his religion. Uh, and an absolutely sterling intellect. And yeah. so uh, that kind of inspired the way that we handled things. We wanted to be a paper that would be genuinely faithful and prayerful and at the same time really appeal to people who wanted an intelligent encounter with the world. And uh, that allowed us to create an environment over the 15 years where we became a magnet for really an entire generation of thinkers in the church and uh, writers, reporters, that sort of thing. Uh, so it was just an exhilarating 15 years. It was one of the, you know, it's the kind of thing that you look back on and, and are just really grateful for that kind of experience in your life. Yeah, it's, uh, that was an inc uh, incredibly exciting change that took place. Uh, Pope Paul VI had been very sick. Mm -hmm. Uh, with cancer for the last, what, about five years of his life or yes. so. And there, there was a weakness physically that aff afflicted him. He was, he was a, a, an amazing, amazing man. I don't think he ever recovered, though, from the backlash that he endured after Imani Vitae. That was a real, I think that was a, a very, very difficult emotional experience for him. I, I think not only the backlash from Imani Vitae, but also he felt totally betrayed 
when he opened up the way for priests to leave the ministry, mm -hmm. and then he, he was dumbfounded at the wave right. of people that took up. He was totally blindsided by that. And I think one of his words was, they betrayed me. Yeah, I think, I think Father, that's one of the, one of the things, having lived through that period like you, I mean, there was just a, a, a hijacking of the idea of the church being open to the world and essentially losing her sense of mission and evangelical zeal in the process, at least among American Catholics. And that was one of the Western issues we dealt Catholics with. Western Catholics in general. Yeah. Uh, it, it affected Europe, Australia, North America. But we dealt with that. That was one of the... That was one of the formative experiences of, of working at the register at the time was to, and, and uh, you know, John Paul II was, I, I like to say in a centrifugal age, he was a centripetal force. He brought things together. If you reread Redemptoris, uh, pardon me, not just, not Redemptoris Mater, but Redemptor Hominis, mm -hmm. that's a, an anthropology, a vision of man that really kind of informed the entire way we worked for 15 years. Mm -hmm. And his, I think it was important that both he and Pope Benedict XVI had been young men yeah. actively participating in the Vatican Council, mm -hmm. and that Wojtyla had been extremely active and vigorous in implementing the Council in Kraków. Right. Uh, people think, oh, the Polish Catholics, they're sort of conservative. That's, that wasn't it at all. He really integrated that and throughout his papacy kept the same program of integration of Vatican II in every encyclical, every apostolic exhortation. You know, the other thing that Kevin said, he made the comment that ideas have consequences. And I think both of those men, John Paul II and Benedict XVI embodied that. They really understood the importance of faith and reason, the importance of having a deep faith life and a, and a you know, a, a vigorous intellectual life, an ability to think, not just feel. And there are times these days when that's just lacking in a lot of a lot of Catholics. The the they can Catholics. Well, what about the secular people? <laughs> right. I mean, that, I mean, we're talking dumb. Yeah. Uh, I mean, historically uh, ignorant and philosophically incompetent. See, that's why, and and Jeanette can speak to this. But that's why uh, a printed publication is so important because you can't be educated unless you read. I'm not against these other technologies, but but that is a really important factor. Mm -hmm. It, it mm -hmm. is indeed. I mean, it's it's hard that we've been we're continuing to print this because, as you said in the beginning, it's hard to stay alive uh, in this uh, in this age with uh, print publications, but that's why we continue to have it. That's why EWTN took this up and has continued to do it because reading the printed printed word is it does something different to your brain than than communicating in uh, you know 140 characters or, or, or less. <laughs> I mean, how do you communicate the faith in, a, in in 140 characters with any kind of depth? I'm not knocking the technology because it does have its uses, but Catholics are supposed to think, not simply feel. The two things go together. Well, that's, certainly we are living at a time when strong expression of my feelings mm -hmm. is far more authoritative or else. <laughs> I, and I, I, I've said this to folks, the, the way that the uh, improper language, the, the foul mm -hmm. language that permeates the internet and Twitter, et cetera, all these very bad words that you figure out even when they show the blotted out parts okay. in the, um, that they leave first, enough first letters and spaces to figure out that these people need their mouths washed out <laughs> with a lot of soap. And my mother gave soap that made you want to stop doing that. <laughs> but it's because they use it as punctuation mm -hmm. instead of knowing grammar. And they use emotion rather than knowledge and insight. And this makes people come off as very, very foolish. You know, I, I, we just saw 
a um, couple weeks ago that in response to the horrendous killings at the church in Texas, how many people were, were saying, no, don't pray. You know, one, one of the Hollywood actors said, don't pray. God answered them with bullets. Wow. You express an evil thought like that in using your emotions um, instead of how do I present what, you know, a thoughtful, reflective, an uplifting message. That's, you don't get blogs in the National Catholic Register. Well, we do have blogs, but they go along with the yeah, National Catholic. They're blogs Not in, in the, the paper. paper. Well, that's what I mean. You don't have them in the paper. You're right. Yeah, exactly. people blog, but that's right. someplace else. I think as a former editor, seeing Jeanette take the paper to a new dimension is really really enormously satisfying because I think Jeanette brings to the paper and, and the register as it's embodied now a kind of um, sensitivity as well as the traditional intellectual depth that the paper used to have and does have now and that's as an ex-editor that's wonderful to see that, that, that that's still part of the tradition. Sure. Well I'd like we, we need to take a break just about now so what um, I'd like to do is get to you Jeanette sure. because you are now the editor is that right? That's right. Mm -hmm. and editor-in-chief that's right and you have a lot of uh, other folks working for you we do and so um, we'll see what the chief has to say I mean I start to feel like <laughs> Clark Kent you know <laughs> all right chief well actually I'd be more like Jimmy <laughs> so we'll be back in just a couple of minutes and find out more about what's going on at this Catholic national newspaper the National Catholic uh, Register Welcome back. Um, we want to we want to make an offer you shouldn't refuse. That's the Chicago in me. It's for a six-issue free trial of the National Catholic Register to be delivered to your mailbox. You can call 1-800-421-3230. That's one 800-421-3230. When you call, mention our secret code. <laughs> Only the people watching this or listening on radio know this. The secret code, get your little decoder ring, is uh, 9TV. 9TV. Or you can go online to ncregister dot com slash tv ncregister dot com slash tv well Jeanette the Mello, <laughs> we have questions for you now uh, you are presently the editor as we right. talked about in the first half of the show um, have you just sort of said look I'm I'm young I'm just going to have a revolution and just <laughs> overthrow everything these guys have done in the past. <laughs> Not Is that at what all. you did? Not at all. So oh. I've been at the Register for five years, and um, Fran was gracious to, to speak about uh, me so highly, but really I've been formed in many ways by uh, Fran Mayer. Uh, I worked with him at the Archdiocese of Denver. Okay. Uh, 
and so work. And again, with Denver is where the register is. Uh, headquartered. That's right, which is really quite remarkable. I mean, I, I never imagined that I would be living here in Birmingham working for the National Catholic Register, but I was the general manager of the Denver Catholic Register, and uh, Monsignor Smith first ran the Denver Catholic Register, and it was from the Denver Catholic Register that he went national with mm -hmm. the National Catholic Register in 1927. So, you know, it's it's really all kind of providential, but, but yes, I've I took the, the newspaper over five years ago, uh, mm -hmm. the first editor-in-chief under EWTN, and, uh, and here we are today. Now, did anybody ever tell you why EWTN got involved in this? Sure. Yeah, tell us sure, about it. What, sure. Well, what of is course. He, cause he, so folks understand, mm -hmm. EWTN now owns and uh, right. you know, is the, the uh, mothership uh, for uh, this media, along with many other of uh, the media work we do in radio, exactly. television, and internet, now we also have t uh, a newspaper. Exactly. Why so did EWTN do that? Why did EWTN do that? Well, of course, between Fran's years, uh, when the Frawley family owned the register, and uh, the years that EWTN bought it, Circle Media owned the register. Mm -hmm. And at that time, uh, Circle Media, which was owned by the Legionaries of Christ, mm -hmm. and was going through a very rough time with their founder and, and the scandal mm -hmm. related to him. But also, newspapers at the time, I mean, they were closing left and right. It was yeah. a very, very tough time for the economy and for, uh, for newspapers. So uh, the Register was really struggling to stay afloat. Uh, Dan Burke was hired uh, by Circle Media around that time, I think 2008, uh, 2009, hired by Circle Media to try to save uh, the newspaper to try to save the publishing house, Circle Media. Uh, and he really did some reforms to the paper uh, that would help um, control expenses and, and to keep it afloat. But he realized he was not going to be able uh, to do that under Circle Media, that there would need to be a new, a new owner, uh, a new yes. publisher. So Circle Media was not able to sustain the um, uh, newspaper. That's right. And yeah. everyone recognized that it was something that should continue. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, they came to uh, EWTN uh, through the help of Fran, uh, who was consulted at the time as a former editor, mm -hmm. said, how can we keep this, how can we keep this alive? And uh, through the help of Fran, through the help of Archbishop Shapu, uh, and, and many others, I think, who consulted over this. Who, by the way, is this. still a member of the Board of Trustees right. Right. for That's EWTN. Right. So that was a good connection. I think the Archbishop saw, well first of all the Archbishop had huge confidence in, in Jeanette uh, because of the work that she was doing for him at the time and then uh, he just saw a serendipitous relationship between EWTN and the National Catholic Register mm -hmm. particularly as EWTN expanded its reach and its vision for communications um, National Catholic Register and, and Jeanette were a natural fit so. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so that was in uh, uh, 2011 and then I joined the team not too, too long after that mm -hmm. uh, in 2012. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I've been doing it ever since. Of course, Dan Burke is still our executive director. Uh, Michael mm -hmm. Warsaw is our publisher. Uh, and we are so grateful that, uh, you know, we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for EWTN, if it wasn't for Dan Burke and, and, and Michael uh, pressing forward. And, and it was really, it's miraculous in, in a sense uh, that we are, are still alive as a as a print product. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, well, you're, mm -hmm. you're not merely alive. We're thriving. I, I, I was mm -hmm. going to say, haven't you expanded? We have. We have. So we're at our highest circulation in the last 17 years, mm -hmm. and uh, the the subscription print subscriptions have uh, increased 100 uh, percent under EWTN. So it's just absolutely amazing. But you know, I mentioned that Monsignor uh, Smith had 850,000 people reading the register uh, through the diocesan system. Today, our online readership is twice that. So the page views is twice that amount, and, and then another twice that on Facebook. So mm -hmm. we are really getting this news out to the nation and, mm -hmm. and beyond, really. Yeah, yeah, see, this is uh, an important element because we're also at a time when the news media as a whole, the secular news media, is becoming more diversified mm -hmm. than it had been. It had been pretty monolithic when there were just three networks mm -hmm. that did the news. 
Um, there was some news on public broadcasting, but that was still fairly minor. And now the internet has opened up lots of sources, some of which are sources of tremendous fake news. Mm -hmm. And then there's the um, uh, cable television networks, some of which are also purveyors of fake news. And this is, uh, when you see that, do you get accused of doing much fake news? <laughs> Not at all, really. I mean, we don't get accused of doing fake news. Uh, I think people can accuse us, especially in the contentious climate we live in today, yeah. of focusing on, on the negative or, or that kind of thing. Uh, that can happen, uh, but that's, that's false too because they don't see the whole product. I mean, we've got a wonderful culture of life section where it's all features, it's all wonderful features about the good works going on in the church, about mm -hmm. evangelization and all mm -hmm. of that, not only in the paper, but it's online too. But, you know, people have, uh, people can, in this media climate, they can see one stream of news through their Facebook or through Twitter and not see the whole thing that we offer, the whole yeah. product that we offer. Yeah. That's a huge challenge for me. That's a huge challenge for my team that works so hard to put this together and then put the website together because we think a lot mm -hmm. about where we want to place things on the website. But people don't always see the news first here or on the website. They see it in their Twitter feed or they see it in something that was forwarded or liked by a friend on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So. In there are a couple of problems. One is that uh, people who read on the internet in particular do what they call F reading. It's modeled on the capital letter F. The first line is long, they read the whole first line. And then the second line of the letter F is shorter, about half that. And then it's a stem and that just sort of glancing over. First paragraph, right. And mm -hmm. yeah, you read the, the first, first paragraph, part of the second, and then very little of the rest. Do you see people Absolutely, that doing happens that? all the time. And you know, I've been looking through the archives a lot lately because we've been you know, producing this, uh, this special edition that has some uh, clips from the archives. I've been looking through the archives and I got to some of the years that Fran, um, Fran was uh, editor, 1990, 1991, and I was looking at these pages uh, through the books. Uh, by the way, we're not digital, so I'm really hoping that we can go digital with these archives, but I'm looking through these pages and the, uh, Fran did something very, very interesting and I'm thinking of adapting it uh, to our pages now or to, the, to, to online particularly. It was the facts and the impact and so after the title, he put these two bullet points, basically, that were the facts and the mm -hmm. impact of the story. Because it was happening then, in right. 1990, mm -hmm. people were mm -hmm. doing the same F reading, you know. And, uh, but it happens today all the time. People don't even read the whole story, and then they'll start emailing me or, or uh, commenting, and you can tell they didn't even <laughs> read the story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well. So. I taught university and high school. I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't read the whole book. Right, <laughs> right. right. Or the article. So this is uh, important. And then the second element too is, you know, especially with, uh, I've noticed it with, with reporting on Pope Francis. Mm -hmm. So frequently things that he says a, a, a little not even a sound bite, it's a half bite. You know, it's just tiny little phrase taken out of its context. Sure. And I imagine that you have to do a lot of work of trying to put it back into context. Absolutely. Showing the original sources. Absolutely, we, we do have to do that a lot. Uh, with, with not only Pope Francis, it happens with President Trump, it happens, you know, it happens all the time now, yeah. you know. Um, but, but we do work very closely uh, with the Catholic News Agency team in Rome. Uh, well, mm -hmm. tell us, who knows most about the Catholic News Agency? We can talk Agency. about Catholic News Agency. Right, what's, sure. what's going on with Catholic News so, Agency? So, Catholic News Agency is now also a part of the EWTN family. Mm -hmm. um, they produce news daily, and uh, they produce... How much does it cost to start getting it? The uh, Catholic News Agency? Zero. So, it's a free news agency. Okay. So, yeah. if somebody wants to get, you know, fresh news from a news agency, you don't have to register with some mm -mm. big corporation. 
you get it for free. Exactly. So the Catholic News Agency do, does that. They produce the news, and even parishes, dioceses can use this news. They can print mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a little different from How us. How much do you charge a diocese for using it? They charge them nothing. They charge them nothing. So it's beautiful. A Catholic News Agency is doing a wonderful service. Again, part just recently in the last year or so, part of the EWTN family. But they serve us a lot. They produce a lot of, of uh, stories that we use constantly. And so mm -hmm. extremely grateful for the work, the partnership that we have with them. And Archbishop Shapu is also very involved in founding that. I mean, he um, enabled uh, Alejandro Bermudez and others to uh, mm -hmm. To find the resources and base uh, the operation originally in the Archdiocese offices in Denver, and, uh, and then of course it grew to where it is now. Absolutely. One of the things that I like as one of the old timers around here at EWTN, I've been, it'll be almost 34 years that I've been doing programs you know, here at EWTN. Well, that's amazing. That's that, that's that, no, no. <laughs> but one of the things that I see as consistent is that. Mother Angelica did not take the business model of cable of the early mm -hmm. 80s, which was, we'll do programming, mm -hmm. and then every subscriber would pay for that particular channel. Mm -hmm. For every channel you wanted extra, you paid a few, uh, another dollar or two a month in mm -hmm. those days. <laughs> they pay more. Um, and that was the model, it's still used by uh, HBO and Showtime and other uh, of the prime networks. She, her attitude came from the gospel. You put it out there. You, you, you give it away and let the Lord take care of you. And uh, she and Ted Turner had the same idea at the same time. <laughs> Did you know that? No. Yeah, yeah, they both, he had the same idea that CNN would start off, just give it, an, it's a freebie on your computer, on your um, uh, uh, cable package. And she had done something independently of him. And it was, it became an anchor gift. It was just a gift. That's how she, we do radio still. Sure. We had the radio um, convention last week. We give the radio signal away. We give the television signal away. We don't charge anybody. And the CNA is following, uh, the Catholic News Agency follows the same approach. Absolutely. That's, a, that's the approach they have. And I know, I mean, it would be wonderful if we could give this, this product away. The printing is so expensive to do, but, is but, it? but, but, but you know, it's a, um, it's, a, it's a gift to continue to print this product. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful it's, product. It's, it's a it's really beautiful well product. Really beautiful. But people have asked us, why don't we go online to some sort of pay service? Because a lot of newspapers are doing that today. I know. I, the Wall Street no. Journal, you have to pay to, watch, to look at some of their New articles York Times, online. I think. The New York Times is going that way, too. Yeah. We, we won't do that. I mean, our, our news will continue to be free. Uh, on the website, of course, and, um, and and part of it is because of that that desire Mother Angelica had, who uh, after um, uh, Michael Warsaw uh, made us a part of the family, one of the nuns told him that Mother Angelica always wanted a newspaper. So I think we are still continuing to fulfill uh, one of you know one of her dreams. So. Yes, she she really was uh, <laughs> like. Pope St. John Paul, someone who did not have a rear view mirror, no. <laughs> you know, in her vehicle. She's just going forward, mm -hmm. you know, and, and even, you know, the line when they, uh, somebody who worked here met Pope John Paul and I uh, said, oh, Mother Angelica, she very strong woman. <laughs> <laughs> he had, had his runs with her too. Absolutely. But it's, but it was that vision forward on the principles of the gospel that you're, you have here. Absolutely. I think, I hope we carry her vision out. That's, yeah. that's what we intend to do. Um, always catechizing. I mean, that's one thing that we learn uh, well from Monsignor Smith, who was always catechizing. 
um, but also from Mother Angelica. I mean, that was that was a part of her mission, you know. And and so through we report the news. Uh, I'm looking at something right here on the death penalty debate, you know. So we're going to report uh, what's going on in that world, and mm -hmm. and but we're also going to report what the catechism teaches. We're going to report uh, what history ha uh, of the church has taught on this subject. That's a part of who we are. Is always catechizing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, that'll be very important because we also have a strong need to apply the catechism in the concrete situations of the world we live in. The catechism isn't for a long time ago. I had mm -hmm. somebody uh, send me an email uh, <laughs> that said, well, my, my pastor said, oh, we don't listen to St. Paul. He wrote from a long time ago. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I had a little bit of a disagreement with the pastor on that sure. and, and gave some of my own clarifications. But it's we do use ancient truth and apply it in the contemporary world. That's what I see you doing Absolutely. with the newspaper and the Catholic uh, news agency and the other media that you're using. The truth is ancient, but it's ever fresh in these new circumstances and given the idiocy of some of the thought or pseudo thought that we see being passed out in other places in the media, it's refreshing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I know I should not hold back like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you see as the next direction, and, you know, the next stage uh, of what you want to do? That's a really good question. I mean, we, as I mentioned, we're in a, a, a media climate uh, that can be very challenging because we keep adding media, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're still printing the newspaper. Uh, we have the website, uh, we added blogs to the website, we have Facebook, we have, a, a ra I have a radio show, Register Radio on mm -hmm. EWTN. That's right. Right? That's right. Uh, we keep when is that uh, on, by the way? It's on the weekends. So, uh, so, we, yeah, so weekend is Register Radio, right. uh, Sunday morning, isn't it? 7 p.m. Eastern on Saturday and Sunday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because mm -hmm. uh, I've heard it on Sunday morning locally exactly. on the way back from church. Right. So we keep adding media. We have the same wonderful team of editors and reporters. Most of our, my reporters, by the way, are freelancers. Uh, so mm -hmm. the, the challenge is always uh, finding people who want to report and not just comment. We have a lot of people who want to give opinions, right, but not a lot of people who want to, to do solid reporting where you give a balanced uh, point of view mm -hmm. and what's going on on both sides, it, that kind of thing. Um, but. But as Fran was talking about earlier, like staying connected uh, to the paper, like to reading, to thoughts, to going deep, because it's so easy just to read uh, the headline. Uh, it's so easy to read in that F form and not really allowing your intellect to be engaged. Uh, we quickly, the emotions arise. You get in the comment box and you start a sort of emotional battle, right? And, uh, and we have to figure out, we have to keep going with bringing our readers deeper and deeper uh, into thinking about what's going on in the church today and applying what we know, uh, the truth of the church, to the world today. And, and we're going to continue to try to do the same mission that, uh, that Monsignor Smith started so long ago, but in this new media world. And it's, it's a challenge. You know, there's always an opportunity to lose heart in a time when so many of the signals in a culture are pessimistic. And I think one of the, one of the great functions of the register is to provide an intelligent basis for hope for people. You read the register and you can be reinvigorated and confident in the faith and you can engage your mind as well as your as your heart and those two things are very powerful when they're working in sync. Okay. And something that you know I well as you mentioned I wrote for you in, the, right. in the past and uh, I also I, I wrote for other uh, Catholic publications, newspapers, and magazines. And I urge people to do that. People will sometimes, and I, when I go to conferences, I feel like Sir Thomas More walking out of court. Father Mitch, here's my book. Here's my CD. Here's my DVD. 
Um, you know, they, I feel like I'm getting these petitions. And my advice is always to try and start publishing mm -hmm. in a newspaper. Let your skills be honed with the help of an editor. Absolutely. Don't Absolutely. edit your own books. I don't read them if you edit it yourself or if you're <laughs> self-published. I don't read it. I don't. I won't. I just don't. I don't have time because I start correcting the grammar and it drives me nuts. Drive her nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do welcome. I do welcome writers who are willing to be edited uh, and who yeah. want to report. I mean, that's, those are. But that's another another thing that you the point that you've made many times. I mean, one of the functions of the register is to provide friendship and comradeship right. for developing talent. Yes. You know, and that that it's not just a question. As you, I mean, you rightly correct. One of the key features is that you, when you publish, you get edited, you develop your byline, people get to know you, but. It's not all about you. It's about the friendship and the team that you build with other people. And the editor is one of the facilitators of that, and Jeanette does a great job of that. That's exactly, exactly. And e editors are your friend. Uh, <laughs> you know, when you're too long or you use the passive voice too much. Oh, that's criminal. Oh, <laughs> it is. Yeah. It is. It's boring. <laughs> so uh, they'll help you with that. And, um, or, or off with your head. So <laughs> be the queen of hearts. Off with his head. Um, and, you know, just uh, that's a great way to get involved. And uh, I want to urge people to do that. Let me give a little bit of the information so that if you want to find out more about the National Catholic Register, you can go to ncregister.com. And you, you can, you know, take up our offer for six free copies, six free editions, and see if you like it. And if you don't like it, then don't order anymore. Uh, but if you do, you can make that order. I want to thank all of you for the well, work you've you done and work you're still doing. Uh, we appreciate it. And I want to give you all a blessing. May Almighty God bless you and keep you, the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And want to urge you to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill. Because we have a lot of bills, not only from paying for the television, and the radio, and the internet, but now the newspaper. <laughs> and your generosity helps us to evangelize so many people. God bless you, and thank you.